The creation of the world, an earthquake carved a huge chasm, leaving man on one side and the animals on the other. Man called to the beasts for companionship. As the dog saw man on the other side alone, he paced up and down the great divide, whining. When man called, come, the dog leaped, narrowly missing and barely hanging onto the edge. Man leaned over and pulled him to safety. And thus began the closest relationship between man and beast. Hi, I'm Rue McClanahan. And I'm excited about having the opportunity to host this video about the care and loving of dogs. I do love dogs, and it's a good thing, too, because I have three of them at home. They happen to be the best dogs in the whole world. But you know, the funny thing is, every dog owner I know thinks they have the best dogs in the whole world. I suspect you love dogs, too, or else you wouldn't have bought this video. Well, the point is, we're all in this dog boat together. And since we all bear the extra burden of taking care of the best dog in the world, we owe it to them to do the best job we can. Dogs are amazingly accepting creatures. They're glad to see you day or night, no matter what kind of mood you're in. They're always there to cheer you up with a big wet lick. I've been around dogs my whole life, and one of the most important things I've learned is you can't learn enough about them. So even though our time is limited, we're going to try to cover a number of areas of dog care. We'll discuss, among other things, choosing, feeding, and exercising a dog. We'll demonstrate some grooming and training techniques. And we'll visit some local dog hangouts, like a dog show, an animal shelter, and my backyard. And when we bring some puppies to a senior citizen's home, I think you'll see why dogs really are man's best friend. Dogs, unfortunately, can't speak to us, but they do have a language all their own. Now, to understand their needs, you have to understand their language. So I've brought along an interpreter, a Los Angeles veterinarian, Dr. David Griffiths. In fact, he's at my house now. I think you'll find him extremely informative, utterly British, and devilishly charming. Thank you, Rue. I'm flattered. If you don't already own a dog, the first step in dog care is choosing the kind of dog that will fit in well with your style of life. Dogs come in an incredible variety of shapes, sizes, and temperaments. Finding the dog that's just right for you needs care and some planning ahead. Remember, taking on a dog means you're making a commitment to the animal for its lifetime. David, what are the kinds of things people should take into account? First off, people should be aware of how old of a dog they want. Do they prefer a puppy or a more mature dog? Next, they should think about the size and consider how much room they have, which sex is also a factor, along with a kind of temperament. And, and don't forget the grooming considerations of long hairs versus short hairs. And last, and probably the most important, mixed breed versus a pedigree. Well, there certainly are enough areas. So let's take them one by one. What about puppies versus older dogs? If you choose a puppy, there should be someone at home a lot, because you must spend time with them to give them a chance to be properly house-trained. An older person may find a boisterous puppy too much of a strain. But with older dogs, you ought to make sure you find out as much as you can about their background and temperament, right? Oh, right. Find out if they're house trained and how long and why they've been in a kennel. Many people get puppies for their toddlers, and I know you don't think that's a good idea. Well, it's just one of my pet peeves. Oh, that's a pun. Pet peeves, aren't you cute? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't th <laughs> I don't think a child under the age of four or five knows exactly what to make of a dog, and especially a puppy that needs tender, loving care. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we'll be talking about children and dogs a little later, but now let's move on to the size consideration. Well, obviously larger dogs are not best suited to cramped city conditions, especially if you live in an apartment or a condo that doesn't have a yard. Generally, the larger the dog, the more exercise it needs. And again, let's point out that we're talking about the dog's needs. Exactly. A smaller dog will be more content with a smaller environment. Two or three walks a day will, will do for him, but a larger dog will need more than that. Of course, when people get puppies, they should be aware of just how big they're likely to get. With a pedigree, you pretty much know what you're getting into. If you get a mixed breed, you should find out as much as you can about the mother and father's background. I've heard that larger dogs usually have shorter lifespans. Is that true? That's generally true. Larger dogs tend to age quicker. A Great Dane, for instance, may not live beyond 11 or 12 years, whereas some terriers uh, could reach the age of 20. It's definitely a consideration when you're bringing a dog into a young family. All right. What about males as opposed to females? 
Remember, these are all generalizations and opinions differ. But females often demand more attention. Hmm. I suppose you might say that's true of people, too. <laughs> Well, uh, yes, I suppose it is. Females are generally easier to train than males. Yes. That's not always true of people. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, males tend to be more dominant and challenging of authority. But with a female, you have a, another problem, of course, which is the added adventure of heat. For those who are not familiar with the term, a female's reproductive cycle happens twice a year, I believe. Well, yes, for most dogs. The bigger dogs, it tends to be a little more spaced out. But on average, it's every six months, yes. And during those times, females have been known to make desperate attempts to escape their home environment. Well, for heaven's sake, what do you think the males are doing, playing with squeaky toys? <laughs> Point well taken. But let's be clear that we're only kidding about something that really shouldn't be an issue. Both of us are strong advocates of spaying and neutering, which eliminates all of these sexual considerations. Now, let's get to mixed breeds versus pedigrees. Well, when you choose a pedigree, you know approximately how big it will grow and, and what its temperament will be like. Uh, the point that can be made for mixes is that they tend to be less afflicted by inherited diseases. And this leads us to the question of where you can get a dog. You can get a pedigree, of course, through a breeder or certain pet stores. And you can get the mixes by contacting um, or various animal rescue organizations or animal shelters, things like that. Well, since most of my dogs have come from a pound, I thought it'd be a good idea for David and me to visit a shelter, find out more about choosing a dog. Dr. Griffiths and I are here at the East Valley Animal Shelter, and we're talking with Debbie Schwartz. Debbie, um, about our two little friends here, you tell us how they got here? These are a couple of puppies that have come in. Somebody found them, brought them to us, and right now they're just a couple of lost pups with no homes. How long do you keep them here? Puppies we keep for three days for the owner to find them, and then they'll go up for sale on the fourth day. And adults we hold for seven days for the owner, and on the eighth day then they'll go up for sale. And how long are they held up for adoption? Anywhere from a day to a week, sometimes longer, depending on their personality. Something, especially as these two, if nobody wants to adopt them right off the bat, then we hold them for a little while, hoping to find them a home. They could stay here a week to two weeks. Here's a question I'm afraid I already know the answer to. What happens when they don't get adopted? Well, the shelters are forced to destroy them at that point. That must be tough. I know it's a fact of life that doesn't sit well with some people, including me, but I guess we really have no idea of the numbers you're up against. Could you give us some idea of how many dogs have to be put to sleep each year? Out of all six city shelters, there were approximately 40,000 impounded, and approximately 24 of those, 24,000, were destroyed. I tell you, if that doesn't sell people on spaying and neutering, I don't know what will. How do you decide on the accommodations here, how many to a cage and so forth? First of all, we separate them by male and female, and then by adults and puppies. And we also have them separated by size. We have two to three dogs to a cage, and just try not to keep it too crowded, at least so they have some kind of company. David, no matter where people get dogs, it's a good idea to be aware of the dog's health. But basically, you're going to rely on two factors. One is that the people here take very good care of them and make sure they're in reasonable good health before they'd even let them out. And the second is that they stipulate that you should take the puppy to your veterinarian within, what, two or three days, something like that? Three days. Three days. And that's obviously the best thing to do because then he will do a, a much more... Uh, uh, a much more careful check of the puppy. But you can just tell by general look, skin and a bright-eyed puppy and the and fact you, that I the was always told to touch its nose and see if it's, if it's hot or if it's cold, well, that's if it's not, dry or if it's wet. Yes, uh, let's, a healthy puppy will have a cold nose, but a warm nose doesn't necessarily mean a puppy is unhealthy. I yeah. see, so it's not, <laughs> yes, it's not too good a thing, no, no. Tell me, Debbie, how does the adoption process work here? Well, you must be 18 or over or accompanied by somebody who is over 18, and they must be available. Once they are available, somebody comes in, chooses a pet, and they go up and take care of the necessary fees, which include all the vaccinations and sterilization and licensing, and then they come and get their new pet. Well, if a person is able to adopt a dog, what are the fees and requirements involved? There's different prices for puppies and adults, as well as male and female. Puppies, uh, the males are about $25, and the females are about 31. Adults are about 45 for males, and females about 52. So why are females more expensive? The spaying fee for females is more than it is for the males, for oh. the neutering. It's so important that people follow through with spaying and neutering. 
At what age should you have it done? At any time after six months of age, that's when they start reaching their sexual maturity and it's time to have them done before they go into their first heat cycle. Can people have their own vet do the sterilization? Absolutely. You can bring it to your veterinarian and have the sterilization done. You must bring us a sterilization certificate afterwards so that we can get you your license and get things all set up. Oh, I'm glad you're strict about it. I wanted to ask you about the new identification method of using those microchips. The microchips are injected underneath the skin, right between the shoulder blades. We have a scanner that we use that picks up the number on the microchip, and then we can locate the owners through that. I can give you a good reason as to why. All right. Who is that? This is one of Hello. our new friends. Hello. It's a Pomeranian. Was, yes, it is. It's a purebred Pomeranian. My gosh. Somebody found him and brought him into us. He has absolutely no identification on him whatsoever. Oh. And I know somebody's heartbroken. So if, if they had identification on him, it could be home with his owners already. Mm. And it's very young. You can tell from his face yeah. he's not very old. He's not too young. He's a young adult, a couple yeah. of years. Oh, that just kills me. That's so heartbreaking. I have one last question, Debbie. You have a job that's got to be so difficult at times. How do you deal with that? Those that have to be destroyed, that's just something we have to deal with. They're, they're better like that than they are malnutrition, hit by cars, you know, suffering. I think you and your co-workers are doing an amazing job here. And I just want to thank you for all your help today. You've been terrific. Thank you very much. Believe me, it wasn't easy leaving there and not bringing one of those darlings home, but I had promised my menagerie that there'd be no new siblings for a day or two anyway. Well, we've talked about choosing a dog. Now let's figure out what you do when you bring the pooch home. David, maybe you could outline some of the considerations involved. Well, of course, you'll need the proper supplies. You'll need to create a space in which your dog can eat and sleep. And since you'll be bringing a four-legged friend into the house, it's a good idea to dog-proof your home. And how do you go about dog-proofing your home? Well, you get down on all fours and crawl around the house and see what Fido can get into. Somehow I just knew you were going to say something like that. Are you telling me the truth? <laughs> well, it sounds a bit silly, but you've got to look at it from the dog's point of view. You know, things like electric cords, which he can pull the lamp off the table, but even more important is that sometimes little puppies can bite into an electric cord. That's a very common uh, occurrence. Oh, dear. Mm. Then what happens? Does he well, get electrocuted? They, that's right, yes. Oh, dear. Uh, well, they don't, it doesn't generally kill them or anything like that, but it can be very serious. So things like that you've got to look at from a dog's level. So what else can you do to dog-proof your home? If you have an outside area for the dog to play in, you'll meet, need to make sure it's securely fenced in. Not only to keep the dog from wandering off, but also to keep unwanted visitors from wandering in. Like our friendly neighborhood coyotes. Mm -hmm. I've had some problems with my fence lately. You mentioned before about a specific area for the dog to eat and sleep in. Well, you want it to be away from busy areas of the house. A utility area or a room off the kitchen's a good idea. But make sure the bed or box is near a warm area. Now, the bed brings us to the point of getting the necessary supplies. These days, pet supplies have become so well designed that we figured instead of just talking about them, we'd go have a look at them. So we went to a well-stocked local pet store. Oh my gosh, look at all the stuff there is to choose from. David, as the expert, um, I'm a new puppy owner. Mm -hmm. Would you say that all of these things are really necessary? Well, at least when they're playing with these, you know they're not playing with things they shouldn't play with. Like my satin bedroom slippers that my puppy yes. chewed to a pulp. And some of these um, bones here, they're very good for them to chew on, these chew bones, and uh -huh. it's good for their teeth, particularly when they get to the age when they're losing their puppy teeth. Now, here we have a very good selection and large selection of varying uh, combs, brushes, scissors. And what about shampoo? We're going to need this shampoo, aren't shampoos we? Are, the important thing with shampoos is basically to read the directions. They can be very, um, there can be dilutions put on them, and some of these products in t shampoos are toxic if they're not used correctly. This says dilute with an equal part of water. Absolutely. Now, David, when it comes to dogs, is a bowl a bowl a bowl? Uh, yes and no. Um, these are some pretty sturdy ones here, and, and uh, for instance, this very big one here, I don't know what kind of size animal this one's for. It's for a bath. <laughs> it looks like it, but <laughs> that might be for communal feeding, which, of course, we don't agree with. Oh, no. The two things you really look out for is that they can't tip over so that they're fairly solid right. and then perhaps another feature particularly of this one with its plastic bottom is that, that it can't be pushed across the floor too much oh i've seen that the uh, famous across the kitchen floor bowl licking event yes. <laughs> yes my gosh what an array of collars how can you ever decide which one to pick well these are nylon collars uh, oh 
two of different thicknesses here. Obviously, this is for a bigger, stronger dog. Uh-huh. And then, oh, here's some illuminated uh, ones that, um, oh, well, luminous shine. ones, I suppose. Not illuminated, luminous. They show up at shine night. at night. That's you great. You shouldn't have your dog roaming around at night, but in case he gets out, that's kind of useful if Terrific. you can anticipate that one. Yeah. Um, choker collars here. Oh, yes. What about those? Um, well, they, these are sometimes used for training. Now, they're kind of severe, uh, mm. or they can be if they're not um, used carefully, you know, because mm. there's a, obviously quite a pull there. So you have to be careful on using these. Some people like them and... But they're and strictly some... for training. You shouldn't um, keep them on your no, dog. No, some either. people use them uh, for walking their dogs with. Yeah. Look, what do you think about flea collars? Ah. I always use those in the summertime. Flea collars, yes. They're, they're a, a, a good product and part of a flea problem, a mm -hmm. part of a flea program. You might have to follow those up with flea baths, flea bombs, and flea sprays, and all the rest of it. I always do. But they are useful and very definitely a part of the, um, uh, the flea pr uh, program. Mm -hmm. Two more things about these while we're on them. First, when you take them out of the packet, there is a, a sort of an explosion of the, of the medication in there, and it yes. can be a little toxic. So it's a good idea to hang them up for a couple of hours and let them get rid of that initial burst, so to speak. And the second point is that sometimes animals are allergic to these. So it's a good idea when you first put a flea collar on to watch the area of the flea collar around the neck mm. for, a, oh, well, 24 hours. But usually an allergy will show itself quite quickly. And, and never use them on a baby, on a baby puppy uh, or kid. No, no. The, the, I'm sure the directions are written on what age you should use yeah. them on. You should be very watch them very carefully. One more point. Um, if you get a collar that goes, there's a long collar, uh, just trim it to the length that goes round. Don't have a whole stretch of extensive right. collar hanging out because yes. that's too much medication for that animal. Yes, I always do that and throw that mm. part away. Now, these are really some great-looking doggy beds, David, but, you know, when you first get a puppy, you don't really have to get all this fancy, do you? No, not really. You can have a cushion or a pillow with a blanket on top of it, and the important thing is to make sure that there's no drafts. That's very important, and right. that's when you have to get down on all fours, mate, to see what, the, what it's like at their level. Yes. Um, and as long as you can keep it clean, if you've got a blanket, say, or even a towel that you put on top that you periodically take out and clean. That's, that's good. That's the important That's thing, easy, yes. isn't it? Yes. Then you Very can easy. wash the towel once a week or so right. with your laundry. Right. Good. Mm. Now, these are some really great-looking carrying cases. Wouldn't you say these are very useful? Yes. These are, these, this is a good model. Um, what I like about these is I think these are uh, okay for domestic air travel. When there's foreign air travel or going on foreign lines, it's probably best to check and make sure that they, they are what required. But these are okay for the USA. And what I like about them is they come apart halfway and you can take the top off. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you're traveling a lot with your dog, it's a good idea to get him used to sleeping in this bottom part. Oh. In fact, make it his bed. And so then all you do when he's traveling is put the top on and then he's, he's traveling in his bed, right? Yes, right. that is very smart. Mm. Um, do you think sometimes maybe people though should board their dogs uh, with a kennel or with their veterinarian? And if so, which would be preferable? It depends on the, the layout. You should go and have a look at it, and if the animals look content and happy and the place is clean and you like the approach of the people, that's the best thing. Uh, some veterinarians specialize in boarding, some don't. Some kennels are so highly specialized that they're better than some veterinarians. It's, it's kind of variable. Um, the important thing is that maybe the fussier they are, the better, uh, mainly for vaccinations, if they're very insistent that your dog is vaccinated. Mm -hmm. That's a good sign, good, obviously, yeah. so all, the others would all be vaccinated. And but look it over, right? That's right. You want to get a general um, Go in the back and the see where the dog's yes, going to be staying, right. not just how they yes. look in front. Oh, another point about traveling with the, is with um, sedation. Yes, you know? what about um, that? Well, um, if, they, if they need it at all, then, then use it, because the... Um, an animal that's rested and quiet is better than one that's fractious. I know there are some dogs and, which will travel without sedatives, but it's probably a good uh, idea to but use But you them. really shouldn't just run across the street to the drugstore and pick up no. some Dramamine and give them a couple Absolutely of not. No. no, go to your veterinarian and get the right stuff. You really have a terrific story here, Sherry. Thank you for letting us show ourselves around. Who is this lovely fellow and where did he come from? Well, he's a she. Oh. Yeah. Um, we have to be very careful about that, veterinarians. If we talk to an owner about their dog and say a she and it's a he, they get most upset, which you can understand really. So we always check the sex on the sheet before we answer the phones. I we... do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, <laughs> she's a, a, a wirehead fox terrier. Uh -huh. And um, the reason I, she's my new friend is because 
I had a, a fox terrier of my own when I was six years old. That was my very first pet. He was called Simon. And um, you notice I was six years old before I had the dog, because under six, as, you, as we've said, is not a good time to have dogs. Yes. Anyway, they're very pretty dogs. They're also a smooth-haired variety, um, which is, well, smooth-haired compared to this one. doesn't have all this fluff around there. But they're... they're... And they're easygoing? Um, yes. Terriers... Uh, got a lot of spunk in them, you know. Yes. Terriers are not easy-going, placid dogs. But I mean, they're not whole nervous. Thing. No, but they, they've got to have a little bit of go because they go down holes, of course. After, yes. Oh, that's what they're bred for originally. Well, this she's one a darling. Well. Oh, she's beautiful. You know, of the over 30 million families that have dogs, many of them have more than one pet. So another consideration when bringing home a new dog is how to handle the adjustment of the established pet. You know, with three dogs and three cats, I'd have to say that you're the expert on the subject of adjustment. Why don't I ask you the questions this time? Why not? I'm game. All right. With three dogs, have you ever had any difficulties when you added a new one to the pack? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, David. As a matter of fact, yes, I have. When I brought little Angie in a year ago, I had two bigger dogs at the time and one smaller dog who has since died. And there was, oh, we, there were about six weeks, I would say, of adjustment necessary. We had to be very patient with each other. So what would you say was the biggest thing you have to pay attention to when you're uh, bringing dogs into the house? What's the biggest problem? Patience. Patience. I think when you are introducing a new animal, yeah, mm. to the established animals, patience. Because they are going to be upset, and you can't be upset. You have to, you have to make them understand by your manner and your lovingness that you love them all as much as the other, mm -hmm. and each one has their special place in your heart. And then they, then they feel more secure. Mm. That was terrific. Oh, thanks. I'd just like to add that people should make sure that each dog has his own food bowl and, and keep an eye out for one eating the other's food. 99% mm -hmm. of all the dog fight wounds that I see are over food, you know, one dog taking another's. If they each have bowls, it'll also help you monitor their eating and know whether each one's appetite is up to scratch. Actually, we'll be talking about uh, food and dietary needs almost immediately because we're going to move on to the general topic of health and fitness, okay? Good idea. In the past few years, people have grown more aware of their own health and fitness. Working out at health clubs and paying closer attention to maintaining a healthy diet. Well, dog owners ought to be aware that health and fitness is just as important to a dog's well-being. David, what are the questions dog owners ask most about feeding their dogs? Well, they usually want to know what to feed, how much, and when. Those are the big ones. Well, let's take them one by one. What are the considerations involved with what kind of food do you feed your dog? Well, age and size are to be taken into account here. Puppies, for instance, need more vitamins and minerals for growth than mature dogs do. And bigger dogs have higher energy requirements and, and may need higher amounts of protein. Mm -hmm. What's important to remember, though, is that they'll eat as much as you'll give them, so you've got to be very careful you don't overfeed them. Of the various types of dog food, we have dry, semi-moist and canned. Is any one of them better for a dog than the other? Not better, no, not really. They all contain the required amounts of vitamins and minerals. Dry foods tend to cost less, probably because they can be brought in large quantities. So if you have a large dog with a big appetite, dry food could be cost efficient? Mm, that's right. But you've got to be careful about storing dry food for too long, because it can lose its vitamin content. Really? Well, with my menagerie, I don't have any chance to store <laughs> it too long. Some people like to leave it out for the dog during the day. No, that's not a good idea. And because it's like feeding a child candy all day, it'll ruin their appetite for their main meal. And what about canned foods? How do they compare? They're very popular, but most people don't realize that there are two distinct types. Some are balanced with cereal, which makes them a more complete diet. Others are meat only, so you, you have to add a biscuit or two for a more balanced meal. So dog biscuits are not just treats, they're actually good for your dog? Oh, yes. They're as well balanced as any other product. And they're also good for tartar control on teeth. Well, what about people food? Should people give their dogs what they eat from the table? Well, the problem here is that if they eat too much of it, they'll come to prefer it and not want anything else. And this is particularly a problem with the smaller breeds, you know, the poodles, they get very, very fussy. But what we're really talking about here is what not to feed your dog. Sometimes it's hard to resist feeding a few table scraps, but you shouldn't make a habit of it. And don't feed them anything with small bones they can choke on. Oh, that's right, yes. Or any bones that can break up into small pieces. But a large shank bone is good for their teeth, within reason. Uh, as long as they don't get too aggressive on it, then they can damage their teeth. 
but you shouldn't give them anything highly spiced either that could upset their stomachs. And the other questions are how much do you give them and how often? How much depends on largely on the dog, really. The bigger dogs require more, and sometimes you'll find it's a trial and error thing. But most pre-packed foods designate the proper daily amounts on the side of the packet. S smaller dogs who eat less in one sitting should be fed twice a day. If it's an average or large side dog, a large sized dog over a year old, one feeding a day will suffice, and you might like to make that around your own dinner time. Mm -hmm. That's probably so the dog will be a little less likely to beg for table scraps. That's right. right? Mm. Now, puppies are like little babies and need to be fed a number of times a day, right? Mm, absolutely. Puppies should be weaned off mother's milk at about four to five weeks. Uh, during the six to 12 week old period, a puppy should be fed combinations of cereal and meat about four times a day. Well, what about a puppy's diet after 12 weeks? You start cutting down to three times a day, and at about six months, down to twice a day. Lately, I've heard a lot of talk about diet supplements for dogs. Is that good? Well, it's good for very young and very old dogs, just like in people. Is there a rule of thumb about feeding older dogs? The best rule of thumb, really, is to be careful not to overfeed them. Like people, their metabolism slows down and they tend to get fat. When we were at the beach with Jackson, we decided it'd be a good location for the topic of exercise. Jackson's very special to you, isn't he? Yes. I always wanted a black lab. Oh, why? Oh, because when I was a kid, I was out swimming one day in the lake, and the undertow pulled me out, and I couldn't get back no matter how hard I swam, and a guy on the beach sent his black Labrador out to get me, and so I just grabbed hold of that dog's collar. He was real strong. And he pulled me just, you know, right back into the shore. And I thought, boy, when I grow up, that's the kind of dog I want. I want a black lab. <laughs> I'm not sure who's getting more exercise here, me or Jackson. Well, they say what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Yeah, I bet you ganders always say that. But you know what I mean. Exercise is important for the health of both people and dogs. I guess the biggest concern is with city dogs, huh? Well, anywhere a dog is kept in a small confined area, like an apartment, say, the dog needs to be taken out for periodic walks, preferably about four times a day. David, I know people can exercise too much. Can dogs? Yes, they'll go till they drop, so that's a concern. I had a case recently where a very athletic fellow brought in a dog that wouldn't walk. And then he told me that he couldn't understand it because the dog went fine with him on his 10K run yesterday. <laughs> But I'd say the concern with over-exercise is with older dogs, with their hearts. Just like in people, if you have a heart condition, you have to go and see the doctor first. And you should be aware of asking too much from them. And I guess bigger dogs need more exercise than smaller ones. That's true, but don't let the little ones off the hook. They need it too. The most important thing, though, however much you exercise, make it a daily routine. And what have we here? Well, this is a Griffon Bruxellois. Gesundheit. <laughs> Thank you. Or a Brussels Griffon, as we call him over here. He's got uh, that funny-looking face. And these um, come in rough and smooth. Obviously, he's a, a rough one. Uh, it, is, it is a he. His name is Boss. Um, he's not very bossy, though. I don't know quite how he got that name. And he's beautifully Isn't groomed. He? Yes. Well, well, a big part of the responsibility of owning a dog is keeping it clean and well-groomed and good health. So, would you explain why grooming habits are so important? Well, um, irregular grooming can lead to a lot of skin problems. And the other side of that coin is that regular grooming allows you to spot problems before they become a big problem. And obviously, long hairs need more grooming than short hairs. Oh, absolutely. And people should be aware of that when they're choosing the dog in the first place. For instance, um, an Afghan may need up to an hour of grooming a day. But that doesn't mean that grooming should be looked on as drudgery, because actually it can be a lot of fun. Yes, if you start them off with regular grooming when they're young and make it a good time, they'll look forward to it. A little friend of mine named Susie just got herself a new friend, so we thought she'd be a good candidate for a grooming lesson at David's clinic. Let's start now with this um, pin brush. Now, this is for getting out big mats, mats that might be in a dog's coat. You just go through it. Now, of course, he hasn't got any mats at all because he's, he's, he looks so nice and he's so well-groomed. But this is what you do with a, a pin brush and get out the very big mats. Now, there'll be some mats, you know what I mean by mats, little tightly rolled balls of fur that come close to the skin. If you leave them, actually, while we're on that subject, if you leave them, they roll tighter and tighter and tighter. And then the dog starts to scratch them because they hurt and then you're, you've got a lot of trouble. If you've got smaller mats, you can use um, the scissors and just go through them and pull through the hair like this and, and get the big mats out. You do all of this before you bathe. If you've got mats on a dog, 
and you bathe them, the mats become ten times worse. So then, having got all the mats out and got a, the coat generally clear of uh, uh, stuff that would interfere with a proper bathing, you then use your bath, and then after that, you bring the dog out and you blow dry him with a ordinary hair dryer. Uh, they get used to that. They, they kind of like that. And then when he's dry, you go through with this brush. Now, in this particular breed, there are very differing grooming rules for differing breeds, but in this particular breed, you'd use it on this, the shorter coat here, but not on this, these longer hairs here and on the tail. You'd, you'd, you'd stick to your big brush on the um, big brush on these. And you'd go through him like this. And then, as a final thing, we use a, a comb like this, which is sometimes referred to as a greyhound comb. It has slightly thicker ones there and thinner ones there. And then you'd pick up his, and, and just go through this, kind of against the run of the coat to fluff it all up. Now, he's very good. He's used to being groomed, and even though he's only a baby, he's, he's, um, he's standing very still. Not all of them will do this, but they'll be, yes, you see. <laughs> but they'll get used to it, and you just go through and fluff up the coat of the comb. So that's the basic rules of, of grooming this dog. Uh, as I say, every breed has a slightly different, uh, slightly different rules, but as far as this guy's concerned, that's what you do. Now, little details we go into here. Let's start at the head. Um, you notice on this fellow that he has these stains here. Now, these are, these are common on, on, on dogs, uh, poodles, and this particular breed, too. And, of course, on the white breeds, they show up much, much more. If, uh, you know, a dark-coated poodle, you wouldn't see them so much. It's a sort of overflow of tears from the dogs. And one of the things you can do with this is put a little Vaseline down there and then period, twice a week wipe it off and put some more Vaseline so that it doesn't stain the coat, particularly in white ones. Uh, there is also powder, uh, which some breeders use, which keep that stain from there. But it's kind of one of the things that this particular breed and some of the poodles live with. Now, coming backwards, we come to the ears. These are very important. This particular breed and poodles and certain other small breeds have hair inside the ear. Now, I can't demonstrate on this dog because he's so well looked after that he hasn't got this problem. But they have internal hair that grows up from the ear canal. Uh, this ear is clear of it, and you can, you can see that it's nice and pink and clean. But in uh, other dogs, you would see hair sprouting up from this canal here. Now, the way to get that out, the best way, is to get a forcep, grab the hair you can see, and twist and twist and twist until you pull the hair out. This pulls it all out from the bottom. Sounds as though the dog would be in a lot of pain, but it doesn't hurt that much, and it's pretty easy to do. But ears are very, very important. If there's any signs of irritation, the dog scratching the ear, rubbing the ear on the floor, take it to your veterinarian, and he'll have a look deep down. That brings up another rule, never, ever, go into a dog's ear where you can't see. Only treat the area you can see. The area you can't see is the, is the province of the veterinarian. Uh, teeth. OK, now, you may not believe this, but we can clean dog's teeth. Now, he's got his baby teeth in here. This is very, you can see right there, there's a baby tooth, and right behind it is an adult tooth coming out. This means he's just at his teething age, just like we lose our baby tooth, so do dogs. He's about four to five months of age, and it's exactly the right age when he should be losing his teeth. Now, when they get the teeth nice and white at the moment, because he's very young, but as they get older, they accumulate tartar, just like we do. Now, there are various toothbrushes on the market which are specially shaped for dogs. This one here is a perfectly ordinary one, but you would just clean the teeth just like you would yourself. Now, whether he will, and he can just do that. If you can do it, fine. If you can't, then um, take it to your veterinarian who'll do it for you. OK, that leaves nails. Now, this fellow is easy because, as you can see, he's got white nails, and you can see where the pink bit is. You don't want to cut the quick because they bleed and it hurts, and the dog will become very shy of that thereafter. Now, with white nails, it's fairly easy. But just for the purpose of demonstration, I don't think I'll actually clip anything off. But you see this guillotine blade like this? which gets the whole nail into it and just trims the end off like that. Well, I hope I've given you some idea of what's involved in a grooming session. The chief thing to remember is make it fun, all right? 
Well, now, what are these? Shitsus. Oh, bless you. <laughs> this is a brother and a sister. They're my newest acquisitions. I've only had them two days. This is the boy with the black face, and this is the girl. I haven't given them names yet, but aren't they precious? Aunt, he looks a little bit nervous. She seems quite at home. She's always been this way. Yeah. I mean, for the, she, she walked right in and took over, but he's just a little shy, a little bit of stage fright going uh -huh. on here. So he's probably the sensitive one. Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, speaking of sensitive, before we go back to David's clinic, I want to explain that another important step in dog care is choosing the right veterinarian. Now, we've obviously chosen the right one here. Oh, thank you very much. But, David, would you tell us what people should consider when they're choosing their vet? Well, probably the best thing to do initially is to ask a friend for a recommendation and then go in and, and meet the veterinarian and, and get a feeling for him and, and see if he agrees uh, with your ideas on pet care. And if you get to know him and like him, that's a big uh, battle won already. Uh, make sure that his office, of course, is near enough to your home so you can get there quickly if necessary. And make sure you know of a 24-hour emergency clinic like David so you can get veterinary help at all times. We're now going to do a general health exam on our friend's stuff here. The first thing that the doctor wants to know is the history, and this is what the owner will tell him. And, Susie, there is so much basic information to give you, I have prepared some charts and I'll review them with you now. These are the diseases that we vaccinate dogs for. All are important. There is a great deal of background information you should know, and I strongly recommend getting these vaccines and the necessary advice from your veterinarian. I have seen many problems result from improper, non-professional procedures. You can start vaccines at any age, but the ideal is not later than eight to nine weeks. Sometimes symptoms are not this specific. Your dog is just not right. Don't be afraid to tell your veterinarian that. He's trained to treat patients who can't tell him where it hurts. There are several ways to treat fleas and worms. This is a list of products you can use. Be very careful to follow directions. Toxic reactions can occur. Injections, of course, are for the professional, but if in doubt at all, just consult your veterinarian. Well, that's an awful lot to take in. Do you think you've got it? I'll try my best. <laughs> well, that's exactly why we've done the video, so you can review it from time to time. Probably the biggest concern of every dog owner is their dog's behavior. It really is the key to maintaining a healthy relationship between you and your dog. But it's not always easy to achieve. In my work, I've come in contact with some incredibly well-trained dogs. And in my life, I've seen some badly misbehaved ones. The problem usually lies with the trainer, not the dog. First, I'm going to get David's ideas about training, and then we'll hear from a professional dog trainer and watch him work with one of his star students. I appreciate you taking me off the hook on this one. Oh, but not completely. I still want to hear your thoughts on the subject. What should people keep in mind when they want their dogs to behave properly? If your dog's behavior is making you unhappy, then he's unhappy too. He may get rambunctious at times, but he want, what he wants most is to please you. Some people think that punishing a dog by hitting them will serve a purpose, which, of course, it doesn't. It only serves to alienate the dog and develop a mistrust between you. I think people often overestimate their dog's intelligence and try to teach their dogs in a, in a way that a dog can't possibly understand. Mm -hmm. At times, we do tend to give them human qualities. Yes, and with training, that's where they go wrong. You must understand what they're capable of responding to. Um... To find out more about what a dog responds to, we asked a professional dog trainer by the name of Michael Chill to come by and give us his views. He not only had a lot to say, he demonstrated some of his training methods with one of his students. Thank you, Rue. This is Sean and her dog, Trapper. A good training program includes discipline and lots of positive reinforcement. Discipline should be firm, yet never severe nor abusive. Never hit, kick, or knee your dog for any reason. Positive reinforcement and praise is vital to creating a happy dog who wants to behave. A pet who wants to behave will behave. One who's forced to behave may not. Uh, Michael, before you work with Shauna, I'd like to ask you for some tips on housebreaking, since that's usually the first big concern. Pay attention, Angie. Paper training is an excellent method for training puppies between the ages of six and eight weeks of age. Paper training will teach your dog to eliminate on a specific substance, in this case, newsprint. Choose a small room in your home, such as a service porch or a small bathroom, or section off part of your kitchen with a puppy exercise pen, which you can get from most pet supply shops. Spread newspapers over the entire area. And inside this area, put your dog's bed, water and food dishes, and a few toys. This area will serve as his living space. You need to keep him in here at night, 
when you're out of the house or any other time you cannot directly supervise him. Since this room is fully papered, your puppy will begin to relieve himself on it, and after a very few days, he'll begin to associate the smell of newsprint with the act of eliminating. Over a period of about a week, you can begin to gradually reduce the amount of paper in his area, leaving some bare floor. At the same time, you're going to allow your puppy more freedom around your home, again under your direct supervision. Since puppies need to eliminate quite frequently, take him back to this area often, especially at key times, such as after he plays, when he awakens from a nap, or after he eats or drinks. Schedule his meals to make elimination much more predictable. When he relieves himself on the paper, praise him. Within a few days, your puppy will be running over to the paper on his own to eliminate even from another room. This procedure should take no more than seven to 10 days with not very many accidents. If there are lots of accidents, you're probably trying to do too much too soon. To fully housebreak your dog from this stage, simply remove the paper from inside your dog's area. You will then be taking him to paper you've placed outdoors. As he continues to stay clean inside, take the paper from outside away completely. Well, I think you've given some pretty good ideas about housebreaking. Did you pay attention? Now, I'm just going to step back and let you guys show us a few steps in basic obedience training. Shauna, first things first, put that around your right wrist. Okay, and take your slack up. That way you won't trip on the leash. Your left hand is overhand, and as you remember, he's on your left, because that's how his collar works. So we're gonna work on the healing. So what you're gonna do is have him heal over there, and then do an about turn and go the other way, all right? So have him heal. Heal. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. And turn around. Go the other way. Good boy. Encourage him. Say, let's go heal. What a good boy. Heal. Come on, let's go. Good boy. Good. Lots of praise. Good boy, Chopper. Good boy. Turn around, come back towards me. Come on, Chopper. Heal. Good Very boy. Very good. Come on, and Chopper. Come right let's towards go. me. Good boy. Come right towards me. Heal. Good boy. Now stop and tell him to sit. Sit. That's fine. Tell him to stay. Stay. Now show stay. him. Good. Now walk to the end. Turn around and face him. Very good. Go back to his side and tell him to lie down, but you got to show him, remember. Use your hand. Down. Very good. Tell him to stay. Stay. And walk to the end again. Very good. Go back to his side. Give him lots of praise. Tell him he's a good boy. Good boy. And now tell him, okay. Okay. Very good. That's great. You guys, that was great. I'm very impressed. Michael, before we have to move on, I'd just like to ask your advice on a few of the more common behavior problems, like, for instance, barking. The best way to stop a dog from barking is to make yourself a penny can. Take an aluminum soft drink can, clean it out, and put about seven pennies in it, and put tape on the top to stop the pennies from falling out. As your dog barks, you can shake this can very firmly. It's very loud rattling sound will startle your dog slightly, and they'll be quiet. Once they're quiet, you can praise them to reinforce the proper behavior. Well, what about dogs that jump up on you and your guests? How can you control that? Your dog jumping on guests is taken care of by obedience training. When your guests are coming over, put your dog on his leash. Have him sit and stay at the front door when your guests ring the doorbell. Then when they come in, if he gets up, you tell him no, put him back into a sit-stay. You can also use a penny can for jumping if necessary. As your dog jumps, shake it firmly, tell him no, Tell him to sit, which is how you want him to greet your guests, and then praise him. A couple of minor diggers. What can I do to break them of that? Most dogs have a natural aversion to their own feces, so you can stop your dog from digging. When you find a hole that your dog has dug, simply take his poop and put it in the hole. You can then put the dirt back on top of it. Your dog will go back and start digging in the same hole, find the poop, and say, yuck. He'll then go make a new hole. Follow him around the backyard. With each and every hole you find, put his poop in it and repeat this process. In about two to three weeks, you will have a dog that no longer is inclined to dig and a very well-fertilized backyard. You know, it just makes sense that if your dog is well-trained, you and your dog will have a happier life together. In just a minute, we're going to see some dogs who are very well-trained, but for some mighty unusual purposes. I promised you we would see some dogs. Now dogs we shall see. Come on. There's really quite a variety. Dogs with bad haircuts. Dogs with tongue extensions. Synchronized pairs of walking dogs. Yuppie dogs. Sympathetic dogs. Dogs who stick to the floor. 
circus wrestling dogs, cotton candy dogs, dogs who let their owners do the talking, spy dogs, heavy metal dogs, Lassie impersonators who have food testers, dogs who've lost their groomers, dogs who look like their owners, more dogs who look like their owners, and dogs who run in circles like their owners. David, one of the most interesting facts I've come across in making this video is the statistic that pet owners tend to live longer than non-pet owners. And that doesn't surprise me. I've heard the calming effect of stroking a dog actually helps lower the blood pressure. And not only that, but in recent years, various groups have used dogs for programs to help autistic children relate better to society, and even in prisons to help inmates with the rehabilitation process. And seniors are another group that seem to respond well with dogs, because dogs can help alleviate some of the loneliness that can be a part of old age. To illustrate a little of what we're talking about, we visited a senior citizen's home with our Bijons. Some programs with seniors actually place dogs with owners, but our only objective was to spread a little happiness. Tell me, Milton, I want to ask you about how you feel about having the dog with you today. I just love it. And can tell it's you. It's great do. because we don't, we're not allowed to have animals here. I and know. I, I'm very they fond say of animals. Your blood pressure goes down when you pet them. Yes, I, I've heard that too. That you, as you stroke a dog, your blood pressure goes down. But it does give you a feeling of. Oh yes, it's true. Such happiness. Great, much happiness. Yeah. That's true. Yes, I had uh, a schnauzer that uh, helped me raise five little kittens that the mother left outside my gate, and I brought them in. They're about 10 days old, and so he became the mother father and chased off the other animals, and uh, Is that right? as they grew up, they would play together and chase each other, and he still thinks he's a parent. <laughs> Is that so? Isn't that sweet? I've never had a problem with uh, introducing cats and dogs together. Just Neither have I. Just open up the car and bring in these orphans, and everybody seems to know that they belong together. So. That's right. That's exactly what I've found. All my life, I've raised okay. cats and dogs together. They're not natural enemies any more than men and women are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe not as much. <laughs> Probably not. Maybe more. <laughs> yeah. One thing for sure, puppies work every time. David, I'm sorry to say it's time for goodbyes. We couldn't have done this without you. And I want to thank you for all your help and all the dedication that you bring to your work. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed myself, and I think you've done a marvelous job in presenting this video. Well, we're both marvelous people, aren't we, darling? <laughs> By the way, I do have those three cats of mine just tapping their little paws, saying, when's it going to be our turn? Oh, I'd be absolutely delighted. Then it's a deal. I guess you've been able to tell that I'm like the Will Rogers of the canine world. I never met a dog I didn't like. So this has been a wonderful experience for me. We've attempted to cover as much as we could in the time allowed. There's so much to learn about these fascinating creatures. I hope what we've presented, we've made informative and entertaining. And I want to thank all the people who've helped along the way. Also, a thank you to the crew behind the cameras and all the various organizations who were so helpful with their cooperation in allowing us to shoot at their locations. I hope you didn't mind when we had a little fun. If I didn't think this was a serious subject, I wouldn't have made the video. But I find dogs themselves pretty funny. That's part of why I love them. What isn't funny is when people mistreat them. It doesn't make any sense to me. Dogs give us such unconditional love. I dearly love my work, but there are times when I just dream about coming home to my dogs. Belle's happy bark and Angie's happy feet on the kitchen floor and Jackson's feet on me. I play the scene every night and I never get tired of it. They deserve the best that I can give them. Thank you all for caring enough to watch. And I hope you and your dog have a wonderful life together. You both deserve it. Take care. <laughs>